Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland, on the fog-shrouded morning of May 12, 1942, became the unlikely crucible for one of the most profound transformations in infantry warfare, as low clouds clung to the test range and five competing anti-tank weapons were positioned facing a captured German Panzer III scheduled to trundle across the field at 100 yards. Its steel hull a blunt reminder of the brutal imbalance unfolding across North Africa, where German armor rolled almost unchallenged. Through Allied positions, while American paratroopers and infantrymen found themselves helpless, their rifles and courage rendered meaningless against 25 tons of armored steel moving faster than a man could run, faster than doctrine could adapt, and faster than bureaucratic procurement cycles could respond. A reality that haunted Colonel Leslie Skinner of the Ordnance Department as he reviewed intelligence reports describing Rommel's Africa Corps slicing through British and Commonwealth. Forces with mechanical precision, reports filled with photographs of shattered units and field notes from American advisors embedded with Allied formations who described, again and again, the same fatal equation. Tanks advanced, infantry scattered or died, physics decided the outcome, and Skinner understood the cold math behind it. That a Panzer III weighing over 25 tons could sustain speeds of 25 miles per hour across desert terrain while an American paratrooper burdened with 80 pounds of gear could barely sprint 8 miles per hour on flat ground, and when those two forces collided, bravery did not matter, numbers did not matter, only steel and momentum mattered, a truth reinforced by grim after-action reports from the Gazala line where British paratroopers dropped behind German lines were overrun when panzers rolled through their defensive positions, their boys' anti-tank rifles. 39 pounds of precision engineering, proving utterly useless as .55 caliber. Rounds bounced off armor like pebbles thrown at a battleship, leaving only 37 survivors out of 240 men, and yet amid this despair Skinner saw a glimmer of possibility resting quietly on his desk in the form of the M10 shaped charge grenade, a revolutionary warhead based on the Monroe effect that focused explosive energy into a narrow jet of molten metal capable of penetrating 50 millimeters of homogeneous steel, theoretically enough to defeat any German tank in service, but theory meant nothing without delivery, and delivery had proven impossible, the grenade too heavy to throw accurately, rifle-launched versions shattering weapon stocks and dislocating shoulders, and close-range placement requiring suicidal proximity to enemy armor, until a young lieutenant named Edward Ewell arrived fresh from Lehigh University, only 24 years old, methodical to a fault, armed not with rank or authority, but with persistence and an engineer's instinct to strip. Problems down to fundamentals, spending weeks examining failed proposals, sketching ideas on scrap paper, rejecting complex mechanisms that introduced new failures, until a routine visit to the Indian Head Naval Proving Ground sparked the breakthrough when he noticed a discarded 60mm mortar tube lying forgotten in a disposal yard. Five feet of plain steel pipe whose internal diameter matched the M10 grenade perfectly, and in that moment you'll realize that every previous design had failed because it tried to contain and control the rocket's combustion inside complex launch mechanisms when the answer was the opposite. Let the rocket burn completely inside the tube, shield the operator with simple steel, eliminate dangerous backblast, and allow the projectile to emerge already stabilized and moving fast enough to maintain accuracy. A solution so brutally simple it offended the sensibilities of experts trained to equate sophistication with effectiveness, and working in. Borrowed machine shops Yule welded together a prototype using scrap materials, attaching a pistol grip, wiring a crude electrical trigger powered by standard D-cell batteries, fabricating iron sights from whatever metal lay within reach, and when the first test rocket streaked cleanly into the Potomac River without destroying the launcher or its operator, Yule knew he had something that mattered. Even if the Ordnance Review Board did not, greeting his presentation with skepticism and outright. Hostility as specialists declared the design too dangerous, predicted catastrophic backblast, unreliable ignition, and premature detonation, dismissing the launcher as an impractical curiosity and urging continued reliance on spigot mortars and rifle grenades. But as spring turned to summer intelligence reports brought alarming news that German engineers were reverse-engineering captured British rocket weapons. 
racing to deploy their own versions, forcing the army to act, scheduling a decisive test at Aberdeen Proving Ground where five established anti-tank systems would compete head-to-head -head against Yule's improvised launcher, and knowing this was his one chance Yule worked 18-hour days refining the design, reinforcing the tube with piano wire to prevent catastrophic failure, redesigning the electrical ignition system with redundancy, carving a walnut shoulder stock whose grain absorbed recoil better than steel, and perfecting the propellant grain so it burned completely in one. Fiftieth of a second, accelerating the rocket to 265 feet per second while keeping pressures within safe limits, producing a weapon system weighing just 13 pounds with an effective range of 300 yards and penetration capable of defeating any German tank side or rear armor, and when the competing systems arrived at Aberdeen they brought prestige and pedigree with them. The British PIAT with Churchill's endorsement, the American rifle grenade promising universal. Issue and three contractor designs boasting advanced metallurgy and fire control systems, but all that sophistication collapsed under real conditions as the test began, the Piat's massive spring sending its bomb arcing unpredictably to fall short or wide, the rifle grenades cracking stocks and bruising shoulders while missing their mark, and the contractor weapons failing despite their complexity, leaving the scorecard at zero hits against a moving Panzer III, and as lunchtime discussions grew. Grim. Yule discovered his own carefully machined sights had been destroyed in transit, forcing a last-minute improvisation with a wire coat hanger and a nail taped crudely into place, an absurd solution that nonetheless provided reference points, and when the final demonstration began, watched by General Gladion Barnes and senior procurement authorities, Yule stepped to the line, shouldered his launcher, tracked the tank through twisted wire, and fired the rocket flying flat and true to strike center. Mass, followed by four more perfect hits that silenced the range, leaving no doubt that elegant simplicity had triumphed over institutional inertia, prompting Barnes to shoulder the weapon himself, remark on its resemblance to Bob Burns's comic bazooka, and issue an immediate order for 5,000 units. A decision that sent General Electric scrambling to industrialize a weapon whose early production flaws nearly doomed it as cracked propellant grains, unreliable batteries, and poor. Training produced disastrous results in North Africa, yet airborne commanders recognized its potential, requesting a lighter, modular version suitable for paratroopers who needed anti-tank power without vehicles or artillery, leading Yule to design the M9 bazooka that broke into two sections for airborne insertion, featured magneto-ignition, improved rockets, and greater penetration. A weapon that would be carried into the darkness over Normandy on June 6, 1944, strapped to paratroopers. Scattered across hedgerows and flooded fields who assembled their launchers under fire and ambushed German armor from ditches, orchards, and farm roads, disabling Panzer IVs with side shots, igniting ammunition, forcing withdrawals, and fundamentally altering German doctrine as captured reports warned that American airborne troops were no longer helpless light infantry but mobile tank killers capable of appearing anywhere. A transformation reflected in statistics showing dozens of armored vehicles destroyed by bazookas in Normandy alone, even as German engineers responded with a Panzerschreck, proving that innovation invites counter-innovation, yet none of that erased the significance of what happened at Aberdeen, where a discarded mortar tube, a coat hanger site, and a young lieutenant's refusal to accept conventional wisdom reshaped modern infantry warfare and demonstrated that sometimes the most decisive revolutions are born not from massive budgets or committees, but from one engineer willing to simplify where everyone else complicated, and fire when everyone else hesitated.